Uh, welcome to this artist talk by Ita Kötte. Uh, she will now present herself, her work, all the things that she does. Uh, in 45 minutes she will be uh, presenting uh, herself for you. And uh, she has an exhibition now in Nome Femme. Uh, and it's uh, connected to the Borealis Festival, the Leibhaftige Malerei, that you will see in Nome Femme in one month now, going on. Um, I'm glad to introduce her to you, and we're so proud and glad that she's here with us. Thank you very much, and enjoy. Thank you. Okay, so um, this will be um, a presentation, not of um, my history or any kind of paintings. Uh, it's more a kind of um, presentation of those things that um, are part of my practice in general and that kind of lead up to painting in some cases and some cases not. In one way or another, uh, and you will see that maybe just in terms of aesthetic ideas, um, it does relate to the show that's over there. Um, if there is a general term for this practice that I, I do and that uh, involves sometimes music and sometimes um, uh, collective activity, group action and performances, etc., uh, I would call it like um, an experimental expressionism. I believe in some kind of um, possibility of expressionist ideas, not in the sense that, are, that they are frozen in a kind of um, style as in expressionist painting, but in a um, more expanded way. Uh, I do relate to a history of these expressionisms in, in a variety of um, cultural articulations. So what, you, what, I, what I do when I'm invited to do these talks, I usually I try to kind of um, make people experience this, um, the fracturedness uh, and in a way like it, the whole thing becomes a sort of a walk-in collage. And that's also um, a little bit the idea of this talk. So what I will present is, and it started already, um, is a series of um, different DVDs that I will accompany with uh, other words and some sounds. And in some cases I will tell a little bit more about what the pieces that you see are. Um, for this one, I would only like to say um, it's from a series of drawings um, that became objects of a performance that I did in Holland. And it was filmed by a friend of mine uh, named Amy Granat, who is a filmmaker in her own right. Uh, and it's on 16 millimeter, and that's why it's very murky. Um, to experience what these people experienced who I did the performance with, I will um, uh, show you what the pieces were and I would like you to pass them around so everybody can have a look.
instruments of expression. What was it before it exploded? Dirty deco? Painting an outrage to time? What was it before it exploded? An abstract visual dream. Bleeding, of course. Where a wounded heart with bleeding eyes conspire, is she a flaming fountain or a weeping fire? The psychic process itself, with its inner contrasts and struggles, is the central object of art artistic mimesis. It's about making express, expressive, making visible forms of desire. What interests me are ecstatic and broken moments. Um, this is um, a part of a film project that this friend of mine, the artist Amy Granat, asked me to do with her. And um, it was actually based on an idea of the late Stephen Perino, who, who always tried to encourage the females to do funny things. Anyway, we decided to do these reenactments um, in the style of like, like, sort of in the stereotypical style of like 16 millimeter New York underground film uh, and reenacting the lives of saints. And each person could choose um, their saint. And I choose to be um, Teresa von Avila. <laughs> and um, and we had to, and it was sort of in that sense, Jake Smithian, a uh, Jack Smithian, that we kind of made everything was handmade. Everything we used sort of props that were relating to our own practices. And um, so I made this heart that I was holding and then receiving the kind of illumination from whatever spirit. And then we made the spirit in the form of a funny cloud and things like that. And they were not meant to be um, sort of real films. So they were just sort of almost like um, a parody of um, yeah, avant-garde filmmaking of that era, the early 60s. And um, she made, um, I think, six of them. And in each of them, a female art, another female artist was playing uh, a different saint. So, one other, just a visual element that I um, have been interested in is uh, glitter, or is sort of. I'm always interested in extreme effects. So, as like say in the paintings, I'm interested in how to make kind of an already in itself extreme color, like red, even more extreme, by not sort of painting it in a in a exuberant, expressive way, but making it actually paint like really kind of painfully like tight. And uh, or with the black also, it's like kind of go pushing it towards an extreme. And in this uh, one other element of my installations and things, which you will see later a little bit too, is is um, these glitter curtains, my silver mylar. So that also became part of the props <coughs> and of these sort of um, things that we used in this film. So it sort of, it just becomes almost like this abstract motion of the materials and the effects and the expressionisms that we're using in our own works to sort of morph into this moment when we use it for a film making process. So the film appears at times, yeah, just like um, a feeling. It's just like an abstract mass. See, this is um, a performance group that um, consists of five people, and it's called Grand Openings. And um, our goal was, and still is, um, a um, to take performance sort of not 
not like as a, um, let's say one performer and acting something, but it is sort of like a meta performance. So it's five people coming from different places, meaning one, me, maybe, you know, I could say I come from painting, another person coming from music, another person more coming from theater, um, getting together and um, creating these scenarios for sort of um, what we call meta performances. And our first one was in, like in 2005, in anthology film archives and in New York, where we used the location, which is a, a fairly known, and it's like the hub of like independent uh, or like um, experimental cinema. It's anthology film archives is like sort of independent film theater and organization, and they inv that was part of Performa Festival, and they invited us to do something there. So we used the location, which is a cinema, as the uh, matrix, so to speak, that so the cinema working with the ideas of experimental cinema became part of the performance, shifting audiences around like to destabilize like the viewer position and, and basically every trope that kind of um, so-called experimental performance we're supposed to have, we try to um, engage in. And for example, one, interfer one interference was that we had these curtains that came down, the silver curtains just sort of dividing the audience, you know, they were not there in terms of... And then what you see is excerpts from paintings of mine that we kind of screened in this really big way that it looked all of a sudden like an experimental movie. So we kind of try to take apart the boundaries of all these different mediums via already existing sort of practices. And for instance, one move was that we had one person using a dark corner of the stage as a kitchen. So all of a sudden the soup, she made soup and the soup was ready and then we started in the middle of the performance serving people food. And it was really awkward, <laughs> really. I mean like just sort of reversing also the, the sequencing of a, of a night where you were supposed to have a dinner afterwards or something. So to, occup to, to take all the conventions of the, the typical performative sort of um, strand and kind of um, play with it. So, and in, in relation to what I was saying earlier, I think it, for me it is very important to um, have, f to let works in that sense, in that case it was a sequence of paintings, have a completely different function and role from a normal like um, or like a, a conventional setting, meaning a, a wall, a gallery, a living room, a collection, etc. But that all of a sudden, um, it has to works have to find completely new values or establish another kind of conversation and have to run also into a new set, new sets of problems of being understood or being, you know, um, disposable, depending. And um, I really, I'm really interested in these challenges. So in a way, I'm always trying to self-induce new problems in my work <laughs> uh, or in, in the way the work is, um, being distributed and being, um, or let's say, acquiring also meaning. For me, it is very important that they, they have, you know, they go, not that they, they go out in different ways. They go out in, in places where you don't usually, um, 
but they might be also not wanted or maybe not recognized, but still can do something powerful. Maybe just because of that. So um, that is just um, yeah an, a, a small documentation of of that first performance where we were also not very professional in our first one and <laughs> didn't have that very well documented. Um, but um, I just wanted to uh, give an, a little bit of an idea of that. Okay, so. Um, I, um, the performative aspect of, of, of work of still pictures uh, interests me, as I just described. Uh, in this project, what I'm what we're trying to show, the performative aspect doesn't lie so much in its um, in the action where it goes out in the world, but in the making of it. And performative in so far that I made um, a kind of um, a rule to myself that I would make one drawing every day. I mean, which is kind of a it's one of these self, you know, imposed sort of rules that one does almost for like therapeutic reasons because it was in a period where I had mostly, I had done already like a lot of m almost like always black work and I really wanted to sort of re, almost like for myself, like relearn color, re rethink aspects of figuration and abstraction, etc. So I really literally made one every day for the period, well, it's like 530 drawings. And um, they all done with colored pencils and they just, um, yeah, they just sort of um, sit there and one after the other. And I choose to never show them so they they don't they were never shown and um, they were private so to speak and only appear in performances sometimes as backdrop sometimes I just I had them also once presented on a just on a monitor a small monitor where you could just sit and watch them I don't like them necessarily like be on a big screen only in situations like that so for a moment so you can enter them and then leave them. So they they have a very strange stat or I want to maintain the their status of something that is not um that's sort of fleeting, you know, like like a diary <laughs> is or something. So I I just like you to watch them for a little bit and I play some music.
So um, this uh, piece, the ones, the people that were here yesterday could see that already, uh, but I would like to explain a little bit what this is. Uh, this was called um, Metalist Moment, and um, I developed it, f this, this visuals, really, um, for um, the Whitney Biennial, the last one, not this year, but the 2006. All the, p all the pictures here are taken, are like excerpts, like details from that installation. And um, the, the whole installation dealt, um, well, it, it came out of a very um, long lasting and um, uh, a few yeah, years lasting a, a collaboration or, or exchange that I had with um, Stephen Perino. And part of that was also um, music that we did together, uh, which I will play you a little bit of in a minute. This is actually Perino. And um, for the biennial, Perino had died um, before this biennial happened. And um, when I was asked to be a participant in the biennial, I asked them, well, who else would be in there? and they gave me the list and I said, well, I don't, I don't think I'm, I can only be in this show if I can be next to Perino, who was also in there, and um, Kenneth Anger, because that was the only people that interested me. And so they gave me a spot that was basically the, I was a sandwiched between the two of them, and I, kind of tried to make an installation that was sort of, I wouldn't say a bridge, but it was a, a kind of a thing, a, the female thing that happened between these two extremes of like very male positions, meaning one was Perino with his approach to art uh, out of a sort of, um, of course, intellectually broken and yet minimalist macho position and and Kenneth Anger from the you know um, extreme sort of gay kind of sexually charged kind of yeah underground filmmaking universe and I I felt that was like a really interesting place for me and to kind of figure out how I could you know, like, relate to both of them. Also, uh, Stephen Perino and I had, like, we were huge fans of Kenneth Anger and had made a soundtrack for one, um, for a project where people were asked to do new soundtracks for his films, etc. So, and, um, so it was kind of important for me to make this a very specific thing. And with this, um, I also, um, wrote this text that I was reciting yesterday. That so it became all like one. Oh, it extended. It, I didn't perform in the Whitney, but it was this um, thing that like went far further than than just the installation in the Whitney Annual. And so it it and it became a kind of important part of a performative motion. I play a little bit from the Electrophilia. Um, CD.
I also would like to point out that um, that one um, attempt in, in the work I did with Perino, but also in my own, is, o is sort of always to bring together, um, let's say, the ethics of a production with that how they appear. So let's say the, um, the whole idea behind electrophilia was that it was totally autonomous or as autonomous as possible in every way, meaning the way that we did, we're not, we didn't want to be a band. There was no career, there was no um, plan on like getting somewhere with that. It was just purely in that moment of the practice itself and we try to sort of like establish like a like every week we would play together and then from that derive a vocabulary of moves that then would like launch into an improvised session when we were playing live which wasn't that often but um and similarly in the in the visual work um a kind of corresponding method is also so the black work that you see in the exhibition but also in the drawings is done in that in that way that I basically rehearse every day meaning I find things I blacken them out I read I think um, thoughts arrive and are written down and then they're kind of when there is a, a necessity to sort of express something, they all kind of come together and become a drawing. So it's not like, oh, oh, I have to make five drawings of something. So if they come out of this, uh, of this kind of ongoing practice. And the larger black works are also come like, come out of this moment of this they're done very spontaneously and they're done often in the site that they are exhibited so the one that appears here occasionally which is this big kind of um, kind of idol woman was done in the Whitney Museum in that very site where it then was hung on the floor and the one that is hanging in the show over there, there were also the black ones were done in the sites where they were shown first. So, so that was just as an addendum to the practice, to the procedures of how these works sort of, um, in a way, they determine their own. I would like to say they determine their own appearance. So it's not, in a way, somebody's taste. It's sort of, it, they come, in a way, they out of their own established rules. So um, the last set is um, just an ongoing a loop of uh, the work that was um, that you saw in the very first film. It, it was all the, the heap of drawings and black things that the people that were sitting around looking at this pile of drawings on this dolly were looking at. So now they are sort of um, appear just as a singular uh, entities. And uh, I just let that run and that is the last sort of um, visual material that I'm, that I'm having here. And um, I make a little more music.
Thanks for coming.